I continue to have the conversations with my black girlfriends around all of this in terms of what is the best way that we or I myself as a white woman can support the black community in these conversations. And the response that I continue to get is you need to go and talk to your white folks about this, right? And and so that is what I've been doing. Um, has been reaching out to um, white friends and family to have these conversations in order to address the racism that lives in all of us, right? That there is not necessarily in this day, state, and age that we can run or hide from it. That when we continue to seek it out in terms of pointing a finger at somebody else, I love the saying of when you point the finger at somebody else, it's three fingers back at you. So remembering that in order to change these things, because we continue to go to social work and society and look for these changes left and right and up and down and everywhere in between, but the last place that we really want to go look and to deconstruct it is within ourselves. So I think one of the biggest things is that we have to note and that racism lives in all of us. Now, is it as insidious as some of the things that have been happening within the world um, and within the United States um, in terms of the killing of black and brown men, women, and children throughout the course of the history of the United States. Remembering that this is nothing new, that this is just all on camera. Um, and I think that it is stirring something within white folks and has been um, for those who have wanted to kind of live in a state of denial about it, you can't necessarily deny the things that are right in front of you. And the thing that is in front of all of us at all points in time is ourselves. So the most important thing that we need to do is to be able to come to our mats or our practice or whatever space that is in order to recognize the whiteness that lives within us and the racism that lives within us in order for us to deconstruct it. So you need to be willing to first say like, yes, like all white people are racist to some varying degree, shape and form. It is not comfortable to say, and I'm a racist, not comfortable, right? But in terms of Joe Dispenza talks about, you know, our behaviors essentially define our personality. So when we start to be able to see that sentiment and the seeds that were planted in us when we were very young, growing up in this white supremacist society. And we can slowly start to pull these things up by their root, to hold them up to the light and to the sun for them to dry out and for them to die and for them to go away. This is why we're told not to talk about these things at the dinner table, because the way that white supremacy and society has been built is knowing that as soon as we start talking, right, is when some of these things will slowly start to be deconstructed. But wanting folks to recognize and realize that this is intention-driven action, that in order to release racism from yourself, it's like being an addict, right? It's like you have to first admit that you are an addict, and then you have to go about changing your behavior so you can start changing your personality, right? And I think after a period of time, I think that you can move away from the space of, you know, not an addict and in recovery, you know? And I think my goal and hope would that be, would be within my lifetime. Within my lifetime, would I be able to say that racism is no longer within me. Um, and it for sure is my hope that the generations that are coming up underneath us, um, that it is, that this type of seed of pure falsity, right? Like the concept of white supremacy, when you put two words together, it wasn't even a real thing. It was make-believe. 
you know, because I do believe that all human beings are equal. But the way that we've played things out is, you know, it's funny because white folks, <laughs> white supremacists, I will say, you know, have painted like a certain picture and manifestation is real um, in the fact that if you sit around worrying about things in terms of there not being any more white people or things along those lines, um, that will slowly start to happen because let us all be reminded that love wins, right? And if your behavior in terms of that is attached to a race of people um, continues, that is seated in hate, a love will come in and say, I'm gonna look for love in different spaces if it's not here. And being also mindful that, you know, it comes from a space of fear and it comes from a space of us feeling that we're not good enough and I'm eternally grateful for the black women that I have in my life that remind me that I am enough and that this is not my fault right but again coming back to the concept of it is not our fault but it is our responsibility if we are yogis in the true sense, then we really believe that our spirits chose these bodies. And we chose these bodies to come into this world at a certain place and a time in order to make and create change. So that those who come after us can live in a world that is more peace and love filled. And again, if folks wanna be able to come to me to have these conversations, I'm very much open to it but to understand that this is a generational disease um, thinking about it in the terms of corona right it it is a virus okay it affects everybody it affects black and brown people and communities at a higher rate um, in terms of death in this physical life right? Um, low income communities and marginalized communities are kind of coming up in that close second space. And then there is the concept of being somebody who is asymptomatic. So not necessarily understanding that you're infected, um, but not taking heed and precaution in order to cover your mouth and being out here spreading things around um, and not necessarily understanding the impact because it hasn't affected us. Okay. Malia wrote a blog post, um, Malia Lazzi wrote a blog post a while ago that says, you know, racism kills everybody. And, you know, the way that manifestation works is, you know, if you focus on your greatest fear, you might end up manifesting that as well. And so I think that's a premise, really need to understand that space. You know, there is a space where we can really embrace love for ourselves, first and foremost, and not from a space of vanity or from the space of needing to be right and white, but from a space of true self-love understanding that we are enough and then looking to as we work on ourselves being able to work to provide access and give care and support to our families and friends in times like these when folks need it most and to be able to stand up and to be able to be silent and to be able to listen and understanding that this is fierce intention so I'm asking all of you during these times and moving forward to look at yourself in the mirror every day or to incorporate it into your practice both on and off the mat to say, I recognize this within myself and I am working every single day to let go of this with clear intention and action, seeing the vision of what could be in the future if this type of behavior and this type of ideology 
and mindset were no more. Because remember, this is man-made. And if man made it, man can destroy it. Okay? Um, I do think it's going to be the women that essentially um, destroy it, though. The interesting thing about all of this stuff is, um, you know, white folks are, we are in a space that, um, where we very much have been takers. Um, and we are at a space right now where I think a lot of us take life for granted. And that is the quality of what could be in our own lives. Um, and taking for granted the lives of um, each other. So I'm not saying all of this um, to say that white people are bad, right? I'm saying um, that the way that the world currently stands is that all white people are racist. And because of this, we've robbed ourselves of a full life experience. So, in addition, you know, if you can't be mad, if you can't be mad about the death um, of nations of people, that this false ideology um, has had um, on black and brown families, if you can't be mad about that, you know, be mad for the fact that this is killing us too. You know, that a falsity was placed into our belief structure um, that, you know, has put us in a space where, you know, we have created, we have, we have created the inequality. And, and that is not just an inequality in terms of, you know, an economic gap. It is an inequality in terms of us as white folks being able to as deeply care about the whole world as much as black folks do. I don't know about all of you, but I would like to be better, right? I would like to be better. And I'm so thankful for the black people in my life that have allowed me to do just that and have encouraged me to do just that. And my hope is that everyone would have that experience in terms of being able to feel that opportunity to do better and to be better in our lives. Not in terms of, you know, the measurement of success, but in terms of the capacity of our hearts. So I want to thank everybody for taking the time to listen. Um, again, if anyone wants to talk with me about any of this, I'm more than willing and open to talk with folks. You know, these conversations are not comfortable. But as I always say in yoga classes, on the other side of discomfort, we don't go and lean into sharp and shooting pain. Right? So if you're not ready, you're not ready. But on the other side of discomfort is change. And so we need to challenge ourselves. We are our greatest competitor in this space. You know, the bodies that we have now are a compilation of the ancestors that came before us, right? And they've been conditioned to live in this space and time. We must set the intention because without intention, things do not move and they do not change. And without taking the light and shining it into the dark spaces in ourselves, the ugly things that we do not want to look at, we will never call it out. I do believe that love wins and I do believe that we will all get through this together. We just need to be open to the conversation. Thanks y'all. Namaste.